So All right. Go. Okay. Okay, great. Welcome everybody to another installment of our uh, link gathering. Today we're happy to be joined by uh, Nick, Patricio, and Stuart. Panel here. Yeah, full panel. Thanks very much for for uh, joining, guys. Okay. Look forward to to. Uh, oh. Okay. Look forward to hearing. Uh, Welcome everybody. Oh, to hang another on. installment of our uh, link gap. Glad to join. I, I guess Technology. I yeah, I know. <laughs> we start the live feed on YouTube, and then it starts up in another screen on a delay and replays whatever we just said. Okay, um, so maybe the, the best thing to do, and, and by the way, I uh, hope everyone at home is, is um, doing well and, and hopefully enjoying these gatherings. Uh, gives us all a chance to uh, get together and talk about language and uh, hopefully take our minds off. Maybe some of the other things are being locked inside or whatever is happening. Um, uh, with that, maybe we'll we'll have um, uh, Patricio. Maybe you can go first. Uh, tell us how a, a bit about yourself for sure, um, and then how you use Link, what languages you're studying, essentially whatever whatever you like, and and then um, we'd have a few questions after that. But we'll grace basically move through our three guests, and then at the end we have time. We'll have time for for a bit of a question and answer. Okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, I'm Patricio, I'm from Mexico. I'm 19 years old and I've been using Link for about two years. Um, do you want me to share screen to show you? Sure. Yeah, sure, please do. That would be great. Okay, so. Sure. Okay, so it depends uh, on which stage I'm at. So when I'm just beginning, uh, I try to read a lot of things that are uh, like the basic courses. For example, uh, the link mini stories. I think you guys added more uh, Swedish ones, if I'm right. And then... How many are there now? Uh, 30, I think. Okay, I'll have to check with Zoran where we stand. Maybe there's more on, in the pipeline, I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I start by reading a lot of, uh, it, it depends, sometimes I change it a, a little bit. So I'm gonna show you right now. It's kind of slow. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm studying right now Swedish and, Ger and Russian, but I have learned other languages uh, on Link. Pretty ambitious. Where are you located yes. in Mexico, if I may ask? Uh, Monterrey. Okay. That's north, right? Yes. It's, it's uh, one of the biggest cities. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's really slow right now, but uh, so I will show you about YouTube. Uh, so I, have, I had an idea because uh, normally I watch the foreign language videos in my uh, other YouTube channel, mm -hmm. but then... I, I have a lot of uh, English suggestions and Spanish suggestions. So if I see, I don't know, a video in German that I don't understand as well as English, I may be more tempted to watch uh, English videos. So I normally prefer to watch uh, videos in, on this uh, separate YouTube account so that I have more uh, variation of languages and of course, without the distractions. So as you can see, here's like Russian, German, Russian, uh, Russian, Swedish. So here you have all this. Um, and then if I want to search for videos with uh, subtitles, I just look in here. I don't know if you guys know this and you click like filter and then subtitles and you get only videos with subtitles. So then you can import easier into Link. And this is- And this is across all it. languages? So you just go, you go Mexico. So you want to see a video about Mexico? Yes. And filter subtitles. So it could be in, uh, in German, in Italian, in any, well, mind you, Mexico, that's uh, some kind of uh, Germanic way of spelling it. 
No, I, I wrote it in, in a Germanic way yeah. because I want to see German videos about Mexico. But if I want to see, I don't know, uh, Reisen traveling. Right. Okay, so I click in here and then I, I'll just filter. Right. Subtitles. Right. And then you'll have all the videos with subtitles. Mm -hmm. um, do it, you it, specify it, which language the subtitles are in? No. Uh, no, you, you can't filter that, unfortunately. But then you just, uh, once you're in the video, you can check that. But he uh, chooses a title that's in the, the language that he's looking for. So, right. yeah, and normally, yes. On that subject, German. the subtitles will presumably be in that language. Yes. And then I'll just import it into Link. Um, yes. Well, okay. let's see if it's. Okay, so normally I try to uh, read all, uh, trying to see what the words mean so I can understand the context. And then I'll just uh, listen to it mm -hmm. while following it, but not caring too much about the context, or about, the, about the meaning, only about the pronunciation. And sometimes I will listen to a phrase and then say it afterwards. I think you can hear it when I click play. So I'll just click play and they say like, Javil para vieta and say afterwards. So I can improve my pronunciation. Good pronunciation, uh, by the way. Pretty good. I thank know. you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I believe that accent is uh, about not caring about sounding, sounding weird, as you said in some of your videos. Plus, another thing that you do that I think is really good is that you listen to the story. You're not too concerned about understanding everything. You just want to kind of get some exposure to it, the flow, the music of the language, pick up some words. At the end of it, you may only understand 60, 70 percent. It doesn't matter. It's just you're not too concerned. And you're starting to notice certain phrases and certain ways words are pronounced. It's just a gradual process of discovery. I think that's good. Yeah, well, I try to separate uh, between Sometimes I'll just try to find the meaning and sometimes only the, the pronunciation. Because I, if I try both at the same time, mm -hmm. I may be confused and it may be too much. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. We, we have a question here. How do you take the subtitles and put, put it, them into Link? Uh, you need uh, to install the Chrome extension. Yes. So here the, I have the video. The browser I need to extension. Move a little bit. So just click in here. And then, well, I need to move this because it's, I click German, import. And it just takes, uh, it depends on your internet, but normally it's fast open lesson. So, but you don't then put it in a, any particular course. You just have a, it's in quick, quick imports. You don't set up a course for travel or something. Uh, normally I don't because, uh, I'll normally import and do the lesson uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. So I don't like do a course and then I'll gonna, I'm gonna do this course and then this course. So I just, I'll normally just uh, try to wait. Now it's worth pointing out again, if you can move your uh, cursor up to where the link extension icon is, I think people may have missed that, that once you've, once you've uh, downloaded the browser extension, you then have that icon. And any yes. newspaper article, uh, YouTube video, Netflix, whatever, you go to that same icon and they click on it and up pops this dialogue box. And then you choose the language, you choose, if you want to import it to a specific course, you can. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I, I like the, the link importer because if you can find what you want on link, you can just look at it uh, somewhere else and you'll just import it and it's great. What I like too, uh, Patricia, what you're doing is you're still doing a bit of the easy stuff, uh, you know, mini stories, uh, who is she? And at the same time, you're going into more difficult stuff and then you go back to easy stuff. I think that's a good thing to do is to vary, vary the difficulty level. Yes. And I don't know if you guys have any other questions. I sometimes, if I can find uh, my content, I will just search, uh, I'll just ask a question here. So. I'm looking for a question that I asked before. Uh, it'll take a little bit again, but uh, yes. And 
the good thing about having the YouTube is that you, you don't get distracted. That's something that I uh, recommend a lot. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for a specific content, so you just, if you have any forum, I personally use the link forum. You just ask, I'm looking for uh, history things in Portuguese or news or, and you say like, I prefer, here I said that I prefer Brazilian Portuguese, but I, I don't mind listening to European or other versions. Mm -hmm. And then people recommend a lot of uh, different uh, content. So it's easy to find good content nowadays. One question, Patricio, uh, ha have you tried the uh, uh, sort of time stamping function that YouTube sometimes offers so that if you're going through a text and if it's difficult and if you go through it in sentence mode on link, in fact, the audio will match that sentence. Uh, I, I haven't tried it. I normally just do the, the whole thing. Uh huh. But you mean this way, like right okay ah, it, it, it's great if you have i have found it doesn't always work but uh maybe mark knows better but in many cases uh uh if it's from youtube it'll be time stamped and so that it rather than this uh audio icon being the text to speech which is which is okay for one word but is a bit disagreeable to listen to for a whole sentence you actually get the um the audio from the youtube video well, okay, it's great. Well, how it actually works is we have a, a, a time stamp. We have an ability to, to input timestamps, which means that even here in the Swedish mini stories, when you, when, you, when you listen to this sentence, it should be the actual audio, not text to speech, uh, because we've actually taken the time to input timestamps for the mini stories. Obviously, it takes time to input timestamps. We have some ability to automatically generate timestamps now, but it's a bit hit and miss and it doesn't work in all languages. But YouTube very often has timestamps attached to their, it may only be with the automated though. Um, okay. Uh, they have automated captions and there they, a lot of the time they have the timestamps uh, as well. Maybe when with the, with the manual translations, unless the, unless the uh, owner has put the timestamps in, it may not work. It, 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 but if, but if manual, the timestamps are present, we can import the timestamps, but they're not always present. That's the- So to, first of all, to repeat then, any, our content like uh, who is she or the mini stories, in many cases we have the times, we manually put the timestamps in. And so far as the automatic timestamps from YouTube, I have found it pretty good for Turkish. And there was even a video in Levantine Arabic and they had uh, standard Arabic subtitles and they came in timestamp. And those are put in manually because the woman is speaking yeah. Levantine. Oh, so and, I yeah. suspect that a lot of YouTube videos will have timestamps and if they have timestamps, then we'll have them too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's really for all users. If you want, it, want that functionality to work for whatever lesson you happen to be studying, you can manually put in the timestamps actually may take a bit of time, but it does, depending on the length of the lesson, it, it can be worth doing because then you do get to listen to that sentence, uh, the actual audio for that sentence. Um, okay, well, Patricio, that was, that was great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely helps me learn how to use YouTube better. And uh, I know we had some good suggestions in previous uh, gatherings also on, on using uh, YouTube. So somehow we need to gather all this information in one place because it is great to learn from people who have figured out the different ways of doing it. Okay, uh, Nick, maybe you can go next. Introduce yourself and, and uh, yeah, let us know how you use, you use Link. Sure, uh, so thanks for having me on, everyone. My name is Nick, I'm from uh, Kansas here in the United States of America. And uh, I've been learning Japanese for uh, about three years now, maybe a little over three years, and uh, about half of that time with Link. So uh, before I used Link, you know, I didn't really know how to go about language learning. 
my only experience had been a couple of years of Spanish in a school, which I, you know, didn't really do too well in. But uh, with Japanese, you know, I started using like some phrase books and some courses and such, um, which were, you know, pretty good for the beginner stuff. But I kept running into this problem of never really getting beyond the beginner level uh, and switching, you know, between different courses, but each one would run out of material. Um, and fortunately, I came across your guys' videos, you know, a lot of Steve's videos on uh, how he uses link, the reading and listening, a lot of the... Um, you know, finding stuff you're interested in and using native materials. So I, I signed up for Link, started using it. And uh, at first I really was just reading lots of short stories, you know, like Who Is She and uh, NHK Easy News and stuff. And uh, I tried to kind of increase how much I did each month. So like at first it was maybe just 200 words a day I would read uh, and then bumped it up to 500 and eventually a thousand. Um, and yeah, you know, I use Blink very similar to how Patricia showed. I basically would just uh, read the page down, linking any new words and stuff, and then uh, listen to the audio uh, so that I could kind of hear what I just read. Since a lot of times, like the way a uh, native will say something can kind of hint at a different understanding of what I had the first time. Um, and yeah, after maybe six months of using Link, I decided to finally try and read my first like full length novel. There's a couple of books on Link and uh, it was tough. Um, I think it took me over a month to do because uh, even having used Link for a while, there were still just thousands of words I didn't know. And uh, I think, you know, after I finished reading it, uh, I maybe only understood 60% of the whole story, but it just felt like such an accomplishment because every time I had tried to read, you know, like a physical book, it was just impossible. It would take so long to look up the new words and try and write them down so I could remember it. Um, and yeah, so that was pretty incredible to be able to use Link and accomplish something like that for myself. Uh, but yeah, you know, I basically just get on and nowadays I'll import, use your import feature to put in books and audiobooks that I find and enjoy uh, and just read through them. and. It's really interesting because instead of like trying to learn the language, I'm really just trying to enjoy the story. And I just kind of happen to, you know, pick up new words as I go through it. Uh, and it's really, yeah, I've never found any other course or anything that helps you learn this way. So yeah, that's pretty much my experience with it. Just like to make one comment. First of all, you are the absolute model link user. That's exactly the thank you <laughs> yeah that that i have that many people have and that is that we just enjoy exploring things in the language not we're not deliberately trying to learn the language the language is just coming in as we explore these other things uh another thing i've said before is when you read your first novel in a, in the language you're learning that is a major milestone that's the mountain you have climbed and everyone should do that because as you say you understand 60 percent, 70 percent. it doesn't matter you have such a tremendous sense of achievement. And, and every time we have a sense of achievement, the brain gets this dopamine kick. Like, look at me, I climbed the mountain, I read a book. Now, you know, I'm ready for anything. So yeah, you're uh, right on. That's, that's the way to go about it. One other, thing, one other thing I would add is when we read, and both you and Patricio, you read a lot, but I find that that's very important to listen because when we're reading in a foreign language, we are always sub-vocalizing. Obviously, if you're reading your native language, it's instant meaning. You don't necessarily sub-vocalize. But when you're reading in a foreign language, you tend to sub-vocalize. And so the better you pronounce, the more you have listened. The listening gives you some momentum so that when you are reading and sub-vocalizing, you're actually getting closer to the way the language is pronounced. You're getting closer to the intonation, which is also so very important. So listening, to me, is a big part of reading. You can't separate. You can't just read without listening. I think. The two of them reinforce each other. The reading helps us remember the words, but the listening gives us that, that sense of the, the music, the rhythm of the language that, that helps us when we read. So. Yeah, great. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the reading books is the, the major driver for vocabulary growth too. You just get so many words. So. I don't know of any other way to get that volume of words uh, really. Uh, videos are great and they are enjoyable, but they're just not as word dense. So, uh, 
yeah, definitely something uh, everyone should consider mixing into their link mix is, 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 is books for sure. Um, great. I don't know if there were any questions that we should be looking at here. Um, I think there's one to Mark, uh, where do you find Japanese books and audiobooks? And I know you also have been looking I for was say, you hey, might did I write that. that question. <laughs> no. Yeah. Japanese books and audiobooks. Where do you find them? I find uh, so, them. yeah, so they're pretty hard to find. I don't know if there's something with the Japanese, you know, digital laws, but uh, I've, I have found a couple on Amazon. Um, there's a lot of public domain books on like uh, uh, some websites um, that you can search for and find. Uh, what I have done is there's a, actually a good number of books just on link kind of in the library. You can search and find them in there. That's where I found my first couple ones. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we should, uh, maybe we'll put together some kind of, uh, maybe even on the forum, as Patricio suggested, get a forum going on, on uh, link books and try to put whatever resources we can find in there and, and gradually figure out uh, to how, to, how we can help people get, get books. And uh, for whatever reason, as you say, it, it, Japanese seems to be, they have different formats and, and uh, hard to remove, and not, not as, as available, not as much information on how to get them into a format that can be accessible. Um, okay, so then why don't we move on then? Maybe we'll, we'll move on to Stuart and thanks very much, Nick. That was, that was great. Uh, how, about, how about you, Stuart? All right, sounds good. Hey guys, thanks for uh, inviting me in and um, I, I'll uh, go ahead and share my screen. I kind of formatted this for my thinking here. What we got here. Okay. So uh, just a bit of background. I teach English. Um, I've been doing it for five years. And the main thing I've noticed with the best students that I've ever had were they were spending a lot of time binge watching TV, especially friends, uh, reading a lot of books, a lot of social media posts like Reddit, Facebook, or they were forced to use the language by being an exchange student or moving to a new country or working with foreigners, especially coders, um, dating. But, and from my experience, I'm living in Brazil right now, so I have to learn Portuguese in this case because you'll just find a lot of people don't speak English here. Um, and people who create kind of these language zones and ones who come to my lessons prepared with questions from their own self-study. And that's kind of really what I want to get into was just like my mistakes and challenges where I was also, I was always focusing kind of like finding the perfect program and or the perfect method. And I realized through watching a lot of uh, Steve's videos, um, there is no such thing. You really got to use the tools, uh, a variety of tools. And I was also struggling finding transcripts because I really wanted to find podcasts, but most of them don't have transcripts. Um, same thing with videos. Although with what Patricio talked about earlier, uh, I discovered the same thing very recently, super helpful. And that kind of broke open my, my uh, just kind of my frustration with studying recently. So along with the forum, I would have to say LinkQ's community is super inspiring. Like I came across this guy here, uh, I think his name is Herb or Herb. And um, he just kind of created a six month practice schedule. And he just basically explain like every single method he's going to use and three hours a day if he can have the time one hour a day and i thought well i have one to three hours a day and i've been focusing too much on just one method or one source of material and really the key is make a do a variety of things i don't know why that never really stuck in my mind as ringing true but after really following herb there it inspired me to just kind of walk in his footsteps a bit and uh yeah, especially with mechanical goals i know steve you've talked a lot about mechanical goals and that's helped a lot with me just you know at first seeing a 50 word a day thing um that's one goal i can have like but i also i struggled with finding being able to kind of study anywhere anytime so i realized i don't just have to study in front of my computer it can be through my phone through listening material thankfully yeah uh, link link includes audio from the mini stories or I've managed to find uh, you know sources for 
uh, old Glossica books, audio files or Pimsleur. So they're not the, they're not going to make you fluent, but just a, if I'm able to study anytime, anywhere, that's my goal. Now, uh, YouTube, as, as Patricia talked about, YouTube is uh, the go-to. Now, I remember, uh, what was her name? Clara from the uh, meetup number two. She mentioned uh, Zero to Hero. I went there immediately when I watched that video. But unfortunately, with Portuguese, it just pops up Korean and English and stuff. So I realized, okay, this isn't my solution. Uh, but the website does give instructions for how to find those, which is what Patricio mentioned. And just like Patricio, in the target language, I'll search for cartoons and Portuguese diseños animados. Or if you want to get um, really more specific, you can put in the, uh, the, the channel, I'm sorry, what you're looking for with um, the country. So diseños animados Brazil. And yes, it's not perfect every time, but within the th first top three or four videos, you'll find uh, videos with the correct transcripts. So, you know, Brazilian Portuguese is unique from uh, Portugal. Now, some of these are Portuguese in brackets Brazil. And usually if you find one, that channel has a bunch of uh, videos with transcripts provided. And if you, if not everyone does, then you can just type in the channel name again with the, uh, uh, with, you know, subtitles CC clicked, checked and you will definitely find all the videos they do have with the subtitles of your choice. Import it, like you mentioned. Um, I'd also strongly recommend this channel for all people in the, low, in the beginner stages, this uh, Stephen Maggie. He's got basically a channel for almost every language, every year, major European with, uh, but they're all, I mean, I know a lot of vocabulary just by being married to Brazilian, but like my sentence structure is pretty bad, but if I, I'm not afraid to go back to basics with, with Steve and Maggie stuff. Um, so do that anyway. Um, and then, uh, yeah, what else should I mention here? Um, video speed, Matthew from Live Gathering 3, he mentioned a good way of studying Spanish by not just slowing it down, but also speeding it up past 100%. And if someone's speaking language too fast, um, just go faster and then slow it back down and ta-da, it sounds like uh, it's slow to you now. So I've taken that to heart. Um, I'll also mention that OCR technology has been pretty, pretty cool. So I like to, uh, I'll give an example here if I can, I'll full screen this more. I like to find signs around my building and I'm like, what the heck does this say? I'll take a picture of it, you know, on my phone go into the Google app and port it uh, or take a picture through the app. Just do an automatic scan, import the Portuguese and I'll throw it right into my uh, link account here. And then uh, I got a bunch of new links for the day to go through. <laughs> so strongly recommend that. If, if, um, if you have PDFs, I, you Plus can you know what the sign says. Yeah. <laughs> and now I can know what the sign says. Um, I also say uh, I threw the, I can't figure out how to do this with JPEG images on Google Translate on your computer, but it's easy to do through your phone. On the computer, you can import PDFs, docs. Um, I actually have a, let me share a new screen here, uh, another program called PDF Exchange. So I have like a Glossika document right here. So any uh, sentences I wanna work through, um, now I, as you can, as I'll just try to demonstrate, for whatever reason, I can't highlight, but this PDF viewer comes with an OCR scanner. I can just put in the page, which is uh, 95 according to the, the digital file. It'll scan it, and now I can now I can copy the sentences right into LinkQ and create a new lesson for myself. So I I, I really just want to get everything I am interacting with into Link, and uh, not lose any of it because I it's really yeah it's really encouraging to see that new words counting up, up and up and up and getting more links. Um, so that's one thing I really wanted to mention uh, on this broadcast here. And then other than that, I know there's probably a lot of people who have books and they can't find an ebook version, maybe they're just too old. I don't think it's been mentioned in any of the gatherings, but there are websites like um, Blue Leaf, 
uh, scanning.com and one dollar scan basically you can send a book to them you can send it right from amazon.com even uh, one of them says that they will return the book to you they won't cut it up but both of them their cheaper price is to cut up the book scan it but then they'll send you a, a file and you can read that on your computer one even will give you an audiobook version of it of course it's just using uh, text to uh, text to speech but I've, I've heard one of them, it was as a sample, it was pretty good, um, but it's just an added bonus you get from it. But I know for me, I got a bunch of Portuguese books that have no eBooks that, or I just can't find them. So I might be interested in using that service. Um, and also Amazon Kindle, I used to search through amazon.com US, but I discovered if I go to the country, of focus in this case um brazil although i'm afraid i might not have saved it here okay well if you go to oh yeah here i got my links so that makes it easy for me so that i prepared that so if you go to the amazon brazil in my case uh, and i'm again i'm kind of interested in building up my my basic science structure so i'm more interested in looking kind of graded readers from the start and Amazon, as you know, is a very organized company. So, but I just found that going to the Brazilian Amazon provided more options than what I can find on the American site. Uh, so that's just the tip I just like to include. There, there was materials I couldn't even find as a, like sometimes I would just experiment a search word on regular amazon.com. It was there, but sometimes it wasn't there as a, as a Kindle option. I don't know why. So I would suggest make an account in the uh, country where the link, um, uh, whatever language you're using, and especially if you're more interested in, say, Mexico, Spanish, maybe go to Amazon Mexico, search for it there. Um, and then, one thing, one, yeah. sorry to interrupt. One one thing there, I, I know that at least in Japan, Amazon yeah. Japan doesn't actually let you buy books, which seems strange. But okay, you need an address in Japan. I don't know how it is in Brazil, but or Amazon I, Brazil, but uh, I. I did. I have experienced things like that in Brazil as far as they want you to have like a local credit card and stuff. Right. Um, I, so I, I'll be honest. I don't know if I use my, my wife's credit card for that, but yeah, that could happen. That could, that, that kind of issue could pop up. Uh, there are a lot of free Amazon Kindle books, so they might let you get away with it if you get one of the free downloads. Okay. Um, but yeah, good note. Um, I, there's kind of like a little tool that if anyone's interested, it's like a really weak version of link, but just read lang. I, I use it just for websites where it's just like menus uh, like this. So just, I don't know. I just got, I can highlight certain words and it pops up. I, I just thought people might be interested in that. Um, but for the most part, anything I'm reading, I import to link you to keep track of my, keep track of my links. Um, and then yeah. Oh, yeah. I like to copy and paste things from Facebook messages, text messages, uh, Facebook groups. I've really gotten to try to get into Facebook groups, kind of seeing how Brazilians communicate with each other, making lessons out of that. Because, again, I mentioned I had a student. He was his main reading material was Facebook groups and Reddit. And he just his English sounded amazingly natural. And he had, he just moved to the U.S., I think, when he was 20 and he was 21 by the time I talked to him. And. He was a bit of an introvert. So from what I could gather, he built a lot of his skill up through that just by um, kind of more natural English exchange through online forums. Um, and I want to mention tags, the tags. Mark, you mentioned tags in a gathering. And I found, after you mentioned those, I found those really useful for myself because sometimes I, I, I guess at the beginning, I felt like I'm linking a lot of stuff and then I want to see it again, and I might forget the word uh, or the words. But if I just create my own tags, especially with like why I'm confused by like grammar question or uh, you know insults, I can just pop those right up and uh, get them get them focused on. I'm not too worried about SRS. I mean, I can show you like I'm kind of am focused on anytime, anywhere. So if I don't have something I'm interested in listening to, if I'm just in a car and I just want to um, flip through stuff I did find interesting and something I read, I, I do throw this into a SRS uh, flashcard app I have. I don't use Anki. Anki's just not my style. But um, I do appreciate the text-to-speech um, technology that's come along, come a long way for these flashcard apps. 
Um, and then I could just, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I don't need to memorize or perfect anything. It's just constant exposure to things I've seen in the past. And it's good enough for me. For, and it's been a lot. I've been able to focus a lot more on studying um, consistently now with, uh, with all of that and not just not trying to perfect anything. But, uh, but yeah, that's all I have to present for you today. Yeah. Can Great. I make a comment and ask a question? Uh, sure. Okay, so first of all, the comment is, I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is the importance of variety. And what you presented is a very good example of variety. And I think a lot of people in traditional language situ learning situations, especially in, the, in Asian countries, they're going to try and nail something down. They stay with it. They just pound it, try and pound it into their head, you know, lists of words, grammar rules. I remember doing that myself. The same German declension table I looked at for the umpteenth time. And of course, we don't learn that way. We can't force it that we're learning less and less every time. We're retaining less and less every time we deliberately try to do that. So if we can, you know, have some easy, some difficult, some flashcards, some this, some that, the greater the variety, the brain likes that. The brain likes to explore new things. So I think you're on the right track there. But I had a question too. Uh, you mentioned Amazon. Can you get Amazon books into Link? Kindle books into Link? Um, boy, it's been a little while since I did it, but I think what I was doing was I might have been cheating with my um, my Google Translate OCR technology. So if I I can I can take a picture of the screen, import it into my phone, and then use that OCR uh, tech. It's a little slow and tedious, but um, I might have had a quicker method. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, it, it and and I you know it, it they kind of change their um, DRM sometimes, but I think. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the last time I tried to, to import a Kindle book. Uh, first of all, you can search Google. And the, the biggest issue is, um, actually, I'm trying to remember now. So there used to be a, there is a Kindle desktop app. Yeah. Uh, so if you have the Kindle desktop app, you can download the Kindle book to your computer. And then you have to find the file on your computer. And once you have the file, then you have to figure out how to remove the DRM. <laughs> But Amazon is making it more difficult now to find the file on your computer, which is, ah. uh, I think, one of the issues. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, I haven't actually done it lately, uh, but at least before it was, yeah, not that difficult. You, 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 once you figure out where they store the file on your computer, you find that file. I think Caliber had a had yeah, uh, used to be able yeah. to a plug in that would uh, remove the DRM. And then you could convert it to whatever file type you needed and import it into Link. But I think Kindle is making it tougher, which is too bad. Like, I've bought the book. Why can't I read it where I want to read it? Um, <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll um, spend a bit of time there and try and figure out a good way of doing that. I mean, I guess we probably shouldn't be promoting removing DRM. I, I don't know if that's illegal <laughs> or not, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, I had another question for Stuart. Yeah, I kind of missed the part where you took a picture of those, whatever it was in your apartment building. And okay. suddenly that became a lesson at length. Like what, what soft, okay, so I go and take a picture of something, then what okay. happened? Okay, uh, I'll open that right now. So I take a picture with, if I could show my phone, of course I can't, but you have the Google Translate app on your phone. There is a camera button that you should see in there and when you open right that, yeah. Okay. Um, you can watch the recording yeah. of this later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then you can click the scan button, which you'll see right there. If I right. can, uh, yeah, you see that there. Okay. And after you press scan, it, it scans everything. Everything's um, actually you can click. Uh, it'll ask you what do you want to scan. You click select all. That's what I do. Yeah. And then it sends that right into this box. It'll show you the the native language and the translated English. I just copy and paste with my finger. Um, and then I, I, I email that to myself. Oh, and then I, yeah. So you yeah, send yeah. it to Google Translate. So you're uh, very clever, very, very clever. So yeah. you're using Google Translate. But, but I'm, I am keeping the original language. It is keeping the original Portuguese. Right. So it's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's just, a, it's just a means. You're us, utilizing that functionality of Google yep. Translate in order to get the thing into, into a format where you can import it into Link. Exactly. I yeah, actually, think that I, I, I've done this before, uh, and I, this is—is is this—is uh, this an Android uh, phone? 
That is an Android. Yeah. I've, um, I, I haven't I, experimented on that, that iPhone though. Okay. I've done it on my iPhone and I, I, I believe I, I somehow stumbled upon the ability to select all or copy all or something. There is a way it's, I will say it's a little confusing at first because there will be a, it, at first it just starts automatically translating it and it's a bunch of floating words. Um, yeah. So you definitely want to click that scan button. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, it, it's, it works pretty well. I've done that too. It's, it, uh, it's kind of, it's a neat, a neat functionality for sure. Yeah. It's Market. helped a lot. Yeah. I, quite a question for you guys. And one of the things, I mean, we're always looking at how we can do things better. Um, I sometimes find myself wishing I was able to email into my link account. How many, how many of you listening at home or, or in this call would be interested in that functionality? Could you explain what you mean? Like if I, either I get an email in Japanese. So now I, I, rather than having to copy and paste that text and create a lesson, if I could just, if I had a, unique email address on link that I could just forward that email to and then it would just create it for me a lesson. and 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 likewise here you know if you you're saying you email that to yourself and then you could probably copy and paste it into link well yeah. if you email it to your mailbox I, at link uh, I, I do I do get uh, emails from Brazilian companies like my phone company or cable company and I, I am always sending those over to link so, uh, so Mark, you would have an email address like link at, like Steve Steve Link at link dot or whatever you know you yeah. link with Steve at link oh okay whatever and you just forward it everything you want to import to your own account you forward it there and it'll just open up as a lesson lesson yeah I like that idea that'd, that'd be cool be good that would be good yeah that'd be uh, really cool yeah okay Mark should be I see away. I see a couple of questions here from Amanda. Uh, so one of them was, what are your thoughts of uh, just having the playlist playing in the background as you're working? That is my major learning activity. I go to a course, I hit play course audio. So I don't have to, you know, make a playlist every time because it's, it, I find that too time consuming. Whereas typically uh, the average course has 10, 15 or more uh, lessons in it, play course audio. And then I can start at lesson one or I can start at lesson 10. And then I make breakfast. So during the day, if I, I'll get in 45 minutes to an hour every day, most of the time I'm listening to listen to course audio, which in a way is playlist, but it's just easier to get at. I don't have to make the playlist. Uh, I, if, I used to have different things in my playlist from different courses. Now I don't. If I get tired of that course, I go to another course, play course audio, and away I go. So that, that's the answer to one of your questions. Having said that, can I just chime in? I, I don't yeah. do that. I never listen to- You're wrong. I never listen to courses. <laughs> I have a, I, I, it takes no time to create a playlist because your playlist is created automatically. Every time you complete a lesson, that lesson is added to your playlist. If you want to, you can go to your playlist and remove lessons you're no longer interested in. Uh, but I tend to just leave it. And then whatever plays, plays, and, and I, it's, it's actually the most easy way to listen. Um, whenever I go do anything, I just start my playlist on my, on my iPhone, on my home screen. I tap on the link button, which gives a, a quick pop-up menu. I tap playlist and I'm listening. It's super fast and it just plays a random assortment of whatever I've been studying for the last six months which is good. So you get some easy stuff, you get some more difficult stuff and you don't really know what's coming at you. Sometimes if I've just done a lesson, then I'll listen to that lesson and set it to repeat. But I, I, uh, I, I never do the course thing largely because I don't study whole courses at a time. I think like I, I kind of just kind of jump from here to there and import some stuff. And obviously the imported stuff's not in your playlist because there's no audio, but uh, all the stuff from the, from our library is, is in there. And, that's how I do it. So I think uh, whatever works for you. <laughs> Although that's uh, that's wrong. <laughs> no, we rarely agree. Mostly, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> um, not so. Not so. By the way. No. So anyway, that's super convenient. Uh, you were saying there's another question there. Uh, You're on mute. There, there was one other. What? Oh, what is the flashcard app? I don't know what that question refers to. Uh, I, maybe app. I mentioned. Uh, I think I mentioned I was uh, using a flashcard app. I I, I I I didn't say specifically. I use flashcards deluxe. Um, 
it's just a little bit simpler than Anki. And like I said, I use it actually mostly for the uh, uh, the text to speech option in it. You can import like Amazon Voice into it, and it just automatically has a nice Amazon uh, Brazilian Portuguese woman or man's voice, and it just automatically reads through it, and it's a good way to to uh, review stuff. Uh, someone here asking, which do you think is better for immersion early on? Watching things you've already seen in a language you understand or watching something you haven't? I don't understand the question because if it's early on, then how is that a language you understand? I, 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 I think understand. if you've watched the show in your own language in a, or in, in a language that you, oh. you, you, so that you've seen it before, um in a language you understand i guess okay well i mean i would say that obviously the more familiar you are with any subject book tv program whatever the easier it is to understand so uh, if you're struggling and you're learning a new language and you can see something where you are kind of familiar like i find this myself when i'm doing the mini stories i know the mini story i know the mini story in greek and romanian so if I listen to the mini story in Arabic and now I'm listening to the mini story, which I've listened to in standard Arabic, I'm listening to it in Levantine Arabic. So the more familiar the thing is, that just it just makes it that much easier to connect with the meaning. So um, to the extent that it, but the bigger issue is how interested are you? So if you're interested in something that you're not so familiar with, go for that. On the other hand, uh, it can be useful to watch something in, a, in the language you're learning where you already know the story. Um, oh, okay, great. We have uh, we have some questions from YouTube as well. Um, as I start to acquire vocabulary, I find it easier to do it through reading alone. Is that okay for the initial accumulation of vocabulary? Well, I mean, from my perspective, reading alone, like anytime I have dedicated time, I read. And uh, I find sometimes, you know, I'll listen and read at the same time, especially in, say, Arabic or Persian, because it's so difficult to get used to another script. Sophie here asks, how do you get used to reading in a, in a, lang a different alphabet? There is no shortcut. You just have to read lots. And so sometimes because I'm, I'm tired of not getting the pronunciation of the word in Persian or Arabic, I'll listen as I read. However, when I just read, I have the feeling that I'm, it's better for me. It's just that I'm lazy. And so I prefer to have the sound to help me along. But if I, in fact, force myself to read, I think I'm really training my mind to read. So I think reading alone is good for you. But it gets back to what I said about Stuart, too, is variety is good. So and I think, I think they're, they're asking as well, like uh, 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 with regard to, to uh, acquiring vocabulary through reading alone, I have to say that I, I almost never do review, dedicated review, like flashcard review or using our activities on link. And, uh, and, and that's not to say that they're not helpful, but I, I don't do it at all. I just acquire vocabulary through reading as you're, you're asking and, and, um, it, it works. I mean, you know, and, and it's, it's a slower progress in, in Japanese just because, you know, compared to say Italian where there are so many similar words to, to English. Uh, but, uh, it's, it's, it, you, you, your, your vocabulary just, just grows because in fact, you are reviewing every time you come across a word in a new context and you click on it. Oh yeah, that's what that is. And then, by you know the seventh or eighth time you see it somewhere else, yeah, you've seen it enough times, and and gradually you start to realize that a lot of the yellow words on the page you, you actually know, and can start moving them to known. And and uh, I I I don't I still believe that that there's no faster way to grow your vocabulary than by doing it that way because you cannot possibly flashcard enough words. It just takes too long. It's not efficient enough. And at the same time, when you're reading, you're getting that all of that 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 reinforcement from the listening and from the reading of the patterns of the language. And and um, I think uh, if if you if I had to choose uh, to do one to, to learn vocabulary through flashcards or through reading, I'd, I'd 
there wouldn't be much of a choice for me. One other thing is I find that in a language, early on in the language, um, the audio that I would listen to is faster than I can read. However, if the, if the language is written in the Latin alphabet, very quickly, I can read faster than the audio. And so as soon as I can read faster than the audio, I no longer want to listen to the audio. I'm just going to read because I can go faster. Now, if you're in a, a writing system that's different, like Arabic and Persian for me, there is no way that I can read faster than the audio because it's such a struggle. So I, that's where I rely on this crutch of, of listening. But I think here again, you have to vary it. And I think one way of increasing your reading speed, if you're at a stage where the audio is faster than you can read, then to try and read along at the same speed as the audio, that's going to help you speed up your reading. Uh, so I think it's just a matter of playing with those two things. You have the option and, and doing it uh, you know, sentence by sentence and then trying to stay with it, trying to keep up the audio speed and, and trying to get to where you match the audio speed and eventually to where you can read faster than the audio speed. Uh, no question. And we have someone asking, uh, how, how did you cope with the three writing systems in Japanese? Obviously, reading in Japanese is uh, way better, very helpful to, to, to have the audio uh, playing at the same time. Um, yeah, the three writing systems, obviously, I mean, you're referring to hiragana, katakana, and kanji. Um, you have to start by, by learning the hiragana, and then the katakana, I mean, you, you have to learn that too. And they're, they're not that difficult to learn. I mean, they're phonetic that there's, I don't know how many, 30 of each. Um, and then the kanji, I actually, I did a book called Remembering the Kanji, which had you trying to, which used mnemonics, whatever, <laughs> however you say that to um, try and remember them. I did that actually for a while, but you don't learn the pronunciations of the characters. I, I don't think it was actually that efficient a use of time, to be honest. Um, I would have been better off, I think, um, you know, just focusing on trying to learn this, this, a smaller number and then starting to read, I think starting to read e, 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 the power of seeing those kanji, the most common kanji, you see them all the time, all the time, all the time. You gradually start to learn them, uh, a little bit of time up front, try, identifying the different types of shapes and the characters good to kind of get your brain. Steve, Steve always talks about the ability to notice, notice that there are different elements in the characters that do tie together and have similar pronunciations. Um, and then just, just kind of forging ahead and, and seeing them. And I don't know, I guess that's how I've done it. And I, I mean, I can, I can make my way through a simple Japanese, not an insignificant number of, of kanji that I can read when I'm reading. So uh, that, that's at least for me, Steve, maybe uh, you could jump. Well, it's just uh, uh, increase your reading speed in languages with different alphabet. You know, I often quote Manfred Spitzer and his book, you know, and he says that the brain is a pattern extraction machine. So the brain will start to pick up on things, but he also says the brain learns slowly. And I found with reading in writing systems other than the Latin alphabet, even if you know it, like I, I, my Russian is much better than my Czech. It's much easier for me to read Czech than Russian, even though the Cyrillic alphabet is not particularly difficult, but you know, you've spent your whole life reading in the Latin alphabet. So you've got all of that experience. Your brain has all that exposure to the Latin alphabet. Now you hit it with a brand new alphabet, no matter how much you work at it, it's going to be slower. And the only solution, the advice is read more. <laughs> that's it. That's all. And slowly, the brain is going to start getting used to it. Uh, someone asked, Steve, your book written in 2003, The Way of the Linguist, was a great read. Do you intend to write another book or have you? <laughs> Good. You know, I should in a way. It was a lot of work. I mean, it's not a very big book. It's like whatever it is, 150 pages. It's a lot of work because you're forever rewriting whatever you're, I, that's the first time I've ever, you know, had ever written a book. So you write it, you rewrite it. You don't like this, you don't like that. But um, yeah, I kind of th think I should because it's amazing. 2003, here we are, 2020. A lot has changed. A lot has changed in terms of technology, in terms of the world, in terms of everything that's, you know, the polyglot community and the number of people who are learning or teaching online. And of course, link has evolved it's, maybe i should 
maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hi, Steve Markin. Guess my question is: Can we talk about being fluent in speaking? language or can we also talk about fluency in reading and writing so do we only talk about fluency in terms of speaking or are we talking about it in terms of reading and writing oh he seemed to be on mute i think if we look at the way the word is used most people take fluency to mean the ability to speak uh, speak and to understand so you can get in a situation, you're talking to someone, you understand what they're saying, they understand what you're saying. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but you can function. You know, if you go to Mongolia to do business, you sit down over a cup of tea or whatever they do there, and you're operating. That's fluent. Uh, yeah, the ability to read, uh, to read, uh, you know, complicated books, all of that is fine. But if you cannot converse with people and understand with what people are saying, then I think the common definition says that you're not fluent. Uh, do you think reading in the beginning stages can be dangerous because you can accidentally learn incorrect pronunciation? Uh, I don't think anything you do at the beginning can be dangerous because you're going to be exposed to so much listening, reading, whatever, and stuff like you, you're going to pronounce very poorly at the beginning. If you get surrounded by more of the language, you will your pronunciation will evolve. I, I don't think anything you do at the beginning can be dangerous. No, that's my opinion. Maybe and, and obviously, at the beginning stage is one other thing that uh, that's super important, which you say all the time, is you should be doing a lot of listening at the beginner stages so that well, exactly you train your brain as to how things should sound and hopefully start to make those sounds when you speak. I mean, typically when I start up and say Arabic or Persian, I'm listening. I don't understand a thing. It's just noise. Lesson one of the many stories, just noise. And I say to myself, how will I ever understand this language? And then I go and try and read it. And it's all these little squigglies. Like, how will I ever, ever overcome this? And with time you do. But listening is 75% is of my, of my uh, the time that I spend. And I have to say that, you know, I get, we get questions obviously all the time and, and uh, you know, there's an automated email that goes out from me to everybody who joins link asking, you know, how they find it and, and so on. And, and um, you know, a lot of people will come back and, and, and say, you know, oh, I'm having trouble. I, it's, it's a lot of, you it's know, if they start on the mini stories, uh, it's, I, I don't understand. I need, I need to, uh, you know, I guess they're probably used to Duolingo. So they'll get like dog and cat and, and, uh, mama whatever they get teach there and 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 they feel like they need that because it's too overwhelming to get this wall of text and audio at the beginning and even though it is actually simple content and it's not that much it, it does feel that way and can't feel that way when you start and the part of the problem is that everybody's can kind of conditioned to feel like i need to understand this and be able to make sense of it right now and i think that's your point steve is it, that no you don't you absolutely do not just let, just read it, try and listen, try and follow along, do follow along, do your best and, and do that and make your links and move on to the next lesson. And when you kind of ha had enough of this one and, and then check back in a month and, and go back to that first lesson that you started on. And, and you'll be amazed at how much of it now makes sense, how much better your listening comprehension is your ability to work your way through it. This idea that, you don't don't expect perfection up front. Don't worry about it. Just let the your brain will sort it out. I'd like to ask uh, Nick and Patricio uh, your experience. I find that uh, a brand new language, and I've done it now for Greek, for Turkish, Persian, Arabic, difficult languages. I get on there, my uh, mini story one, kind of understand twenty percent. I move on to mini story two, three, four, five. Go back to one, and that's the process. And and for a long, long time, it's all foggy. Is that the way you go at it when you start from scratch, like uh, Patricia with the Swedish or Nick, I guess you already had your Japanese going into it, but ha have you found that you're, you're prepared to move forward even though you don't understand it? Or do you tend to want to nail down a lesson before moving on? Uh, well, I normally try to read everything like the first lesson about three times. And then I, I go to the next one and to the next one. 
and eventually I'll come back and then do it again and then come back and do it again. And at the beginning, it feels like you don't understand anything. Uh, it is uh, kind of weird that I, I have the same feeling that you s said you had, that it's like, how can I understand this language? Like I, right now, I don't understand anything. How will I achieve to do it? It just, it seems uh, that it, it will never happen, but then the months pass by and all of a sudden you think like, oh my gosh, I'm reading this in, in Russian and I forgot that it was Russian or I'm reading this in German and I completely forgot that it was German. So that's the point where you, where you start to feel more motivation and other things uh, that help me uh, plow through those stages are uh, watching my stats that helped me a lot. And also taking pictures every time that I, that I, I don't know, yesterday I achieved 5,000 words in Russian and I always take a picture, a picture, a picture. So when I see it in my phone, I, I remember like, oh my gosh, I, I remember when I knew 2,000 words and I was excited and now I know 5,000. So it keeps me going. It's <laughs> a good idea. Yeah, that's great. Kind of saves it in your photo timeline. It's kind of interesting. Nick, um, it's also, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just uh, gonna say it's kind of neat to go to your uh, profile and look at your all time stats graphs, too. I find that motivating. So you can see over time how your known words have grown. Anyway, Nick, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't like to get stuck on something that I don't understand. And I know that uh, I can always come back to it later. So normally, you know, I try my best. Um, if there's a word or a phrase I just can't figure out, I just, you know, I just move on. Um, because to me, you know, making that progress, getting through the book is more important than, you know, understanding it 100%. And, you know, Steve talks a lot on his videos about variety, mixing it up both in content and difficulty. And so after a couple months or so of reading different things, um, when I would go back and reread an old book or an old lesson or something from like six months before, I would find it, uh, I understand it way better. And I might even notice some things that I misunderstood the first time. But I feel like if I had just gotten stuck on it, I wouldn't have made all that progress. So I just, you know, take what I can and just let the cards fall where they may. You know, it's interesting about going over material. So I've been, I've left my Turkish, uh, you know, because I want to focus on the Arabic writing system. So I'm doing Persian and Arabic. And then I get a little bit afraid that I'm losing my Turkish. So I go and pick up, I have a book like uh, Teach Yourself or whatever it is, Turkish book. And I start going through it. And of course, I've forgotten a bunch of stuff. But it suddenly struck me that, you know how you have that feeling if you're going somewhere for the first time, whether you're walking or going by car, it seems like a long way, like it took us a long time to get there. But the second time you go there, it doesn't seem like was that it, that it was that far at all, like you're there in no time. And I have that same feeling when I review my Turkish now that I haven't looked at for months. Yeah, there's words I've forgotten, but like I have the feeling that it's sticking better. Like, like I'm walking through that a lot faster now because I've been down that road before. So there's no great danger in, in leaving something and then coming back to it. And in fact, there's research, this uh, Robert Bjork out of UCLA, who shows that when we forget something and go back and relearn it, we learn it better. So yeah, and that apparently is how the brain works. It, it all gets back to this idea, don't try and sock something in, you know, stay with it until you've got it nailed down. Go off, wander off somewhere else, and then come back to it and learn it again. You'll learn it faster, and you're gonna sock it in to the brain better. So uh, with that in mind, like I don't worry about stuff that I don't like all of you are saying that I don't understand or whatever. I just move on. I go back again. I move on. And every time I'm coming back there and I'm going over the same ground again, I'm learning it better. And, that, and there's, you know, neurological research. And, and if, if you want to look up Robert Bjork on YouTube, uh, he talks a lot about interleaving. So, And I would say too, that if you're, you know, don't understand a word or don't understand a phrase, I always say it, 
if it matters, you'll see it again, or you'll see a similar phrase, or you'll see the same phrase written slightly differently and, and in different contexts. And over time, if, if, it, if those words or phrases matter, you'll see them again and, and you'll learn them. You don't need to learn them the first time. No. Um, let's see what else we have on, uh, were there more questions in that um, a Zoom chat box? I guess we have another one here related to kanji. If I learn kanji in Japanese, uh, will it be the same for Chinese, only just changing the pronunciation? Well, as, as someone who's done both Chinese and Japanese, they're very similar. So between traditional Chinese characters, simplified Chinese characters, Japanese characters, a lot of Japanese characters are similar to traditional. Some are some are some have their own simplification. It's basically variations on the same theme. So it's very, very helpful. Of course, you move into a new language, there's new things, new pronunciation, slightly different forms of certain characters, but it's it's tremendously helpful. Whether you're going from Japanese into Chinese or from Chinese into Japanese, having that characters is tremendously helpful. Uh, we have a Steve. Could you talk a bit about the beginnings of Link and the the that entrepreneur start? Okay. <laughs> Calling it an entrepreneur start is uh, not that accurate. Uh, so I have all I, I've said this before. Like I I have lots of books at home in Spanish, in German, in different languages, and I would read them. And on every page, there's 10 words that I don't know, or 15, or however many. And so you underline them, or you write them out in a list, and then you go look them up, and you never look at the list again, you forgot what whatever the meanings were. So there's still the same 10 words you don't know in every page in the language. That continues, Spanish, German, doesn't matter. So that always stuck with me. And, and when I was learning languages like Chinese and that, I would, and for German as well, I would scour bookstores for for readers that had word lists behind each you know, chapter. Uh, but that wasn't very satisfactory either because very often the word that you needed to know wasn't on the word list. And half the word list consisted of words that you knew. So you say, oh, I don't know this word. You go to the word list, it's not there. But there's a whole bunch of other words that for you, these are easy. Why have they got these words on the word list? You know, So it's just all very unsatisfactory. So. With and then the other thing, of course, was that uh, when I was learning, you know, 50 years ago, a tape recorder was a great big open real tape recorder, which didn't go anywhere. Although there were these ghetto blasters, <laughs> I remember people used to walk around with a great big tape recorder on their shoulder back 50 years ago. But so, with the advent of mini disc players and then the MP3 player, so all of a sudden, sound is tremendously portable, can be found everywhere, online dictionaries, text that's digital. So all of those things come together to create sort of the perfect storm for language learning. So, and, and so with that, I started, the first language that I went after was Cantonese. Uh, and, uh, and through that, I, you know, we, I just, we heard, I heard uh, on Cantonese radio here that there was a Chinese immigrant who got all his money stolen at the airport. And, you know, he came to Canada as an immigrant and had all his life savings stolen. Like he can't, $10,000 in a black bag on his luggage uh, cart, you know, which isn't brilliant. And um, so we said, we'll give him a job. If he's good, that's fine. He stays. If he's no good, then at least we helped him out for a couple of months. So he stayed with us for eight months. He had all, all kinds of trouble communicating. He, he just didn't understand, like he didn't culturally understand. So we started developing basically content. I, I would be interviewing members of the Rotary Club uh, and these are business people like a travel bureau or a doctor or whatever, an electrician or whatever it might be. Here's these people, here's these Canadians speaking in English about how they live. And the thought was if this guy could learn the words and expressions and also become familiar with how people live, that would make it easier for him to connect so that he could be um, a better, you know, a more successful immigrant to Canada. He ended up going back to China. And uh, we tried to interest the Canadian government in that as a program for immigrants, because a lot of the immigrants to Canada are sort of educated immigrants. So these are not illiterate peasants. These are people with a high level of education in their own language. And uh, we thought they, there was a role for uh, Link to help immigrants. 
And we discovered that immigrant service organizations are more interested in how they can extract more funding from the government, not so interested in things that might help immigrants. So that didn't work out. So then we said, okay, we'll make it a multi-language platform uh, without any clear business plan, any idea of what, what this might lead to, it, just the idea it would be fun to do. And that's basically the business model for Link. It would be a fun thing to do and a good thing to do people all over the world. And, and initially we had this model where people recorded themselves and transcribed it and put it up and they earned points and stuff, which was had its <laughs> pros and cons. Uh, it still happens. I mean, still happens now. We still do have that model, but, uh, and a lot of our content is user generated, but it's right. not typically not recorded and transcribed. It's, it's stuff that they've found. So but the longer cool this fact. went on, the longer this went on, and we made every, as I've said, we made every possible mistake in terms of the database we use, in terms of the, everything we could have possibly done wrong, we did wrong. And, uh, but the more we got into it, the more we weren't going to give up. And so uh, we stayed with it, we stayed with it, we stayed with it. And uh, we're finally at a point where we got our nose above water here. And, but the determination was that come hell or high water, we're staying with it. So we're staying with it. And uh, now things have come our way. I think the advent of uh, mobile, you know, like iPhones and iPads for language learning. I mean, people don't want to just sit in front of their computer, the only, the only way to study. So that has helped. A, lumber, a number of sort of technological change has helped us. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's your explanation on the uh, language entrepreneurial side of the business. <laughs> and I should add, uh, because it's, it's basically... Um, you know, Mark and I, I, sh I shouldn't say we do it together. Mark does it and does it in a practical way, because if we're up to, if it were up to me, we'd have 50% more useless functions on link. We'd have a hundred languages, including, uh, I don't know, <laughs> 300 languages out of Papua New Guinea. So he keeps it on an even keel, uh, tries to make it work as a business. And I interfere. I really <laughs> the guru, the face of Link. I'm the fan. Spreading the word. Spreading the word. Yeah. There you have it. Yeah, but, and, and I think all of this stuff, as you say, over time, more and more people look to the internet, look to YouTube, try to figure out, you know, there's a, obviously a move away even before uh, coronavirus from, from brick and mortar and, and doing things uh, uh, remote or virtually. Uh, so all of everything just continues to work to move our way. I mean, when we started out, you know, trying to convince people to pay on the internet was a, was an obstacle. So, so, I mean, it, it just, it's second, second nature now. So it, it's just over time. We've, I, I think you hear that a lot in, in when people talk about businesses that uh, half the battle is persistence and staying with it and, and, and being able to stay with it. Um, so, yeah, no, it's uh, anyway, it's super, um, rewarding especially when we have like we have today with nick and patricio and stuart uh uh people who come on and users who come on and and you know get it so well uh not just uh you know basically our approach steve's approach to learning but also you know how to how to really use the the the, the, the functionality that link provides and uh yeah as i say very rewarding and makes makes it worthwhile. I mean, we, we use it, we think it's great. And to see other people use it and think it's great. Um, yeah. It's particularly rewarding because it's not obvious. Like most people who come to link don't understand how it works. Don't understand why you learn that way. They're all conditioned. All, all of us have been conditioned at school to learn a certain way. And so it's very rewarding for Mark and, and, and me to see all of you come forward. And not only you use Link in a creative way and in the way we would use Link, but you also go find other resources to combine with Link. And, and, and I mean, I love doing it. Like I love learning these languages and, and uh, to see other people doing the same thing is, is very rewarding. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know with that, I, I don't know. I wanted to add one thing. Yeah. Okay, I have, this is a prototype mask <laughs> made by my wife. Uh, I think it's worthwhile spreading the word. There's resistance everywhere, particularly in North America, to wearing a mask. In those countries where they wear masks, not only in Asia, but also in the Czech Republic and so forth, they have been able to, you know, see a big, steep decline in their cases. So 
I just thought I'd put in a little PR here. Get yourself a mask, make one, buy one, get one, and wear it. Because it, apparently now, and of course, these experts are constantly revising their position on this, but it seems it not only prevents you from spreading it, it can prevent you from getting it. And every time you spread it or get it, you're putting more pressure on the hospital system, wherever you are. So I just wanted to throw that little bit of propaganda in there. Well, and it seems like like it's every no governments had no problem telling everybody to stay home, which is obviously much more impactful. Uh, yeah, wearing a mask is not that impactful for, to everybody. So if it, it should help, might help, why well, I just don't see the downside. So uh, yeah, maybe we need to make link masks. Send them to everybody. Link masks. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again. Thanks very much, Patricia. Thank Nick, I don't know if you guys want to have anything to add there at the end. Uh, no, just thanks for having me and thanks for doing what you guys do. Yeah, no, not at all. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, I just want to add a personal experience that I had. Uh, I started learning Italian uh, on Link, basically using only Link, YouTube, and uh, podcast and I, I studied for one year and then I went to an Italian school and I had spoken practically like three hours of Italian the, uh, in my whole life but I had read a lot and listened uh, a lot and uh, they made me an exam and I achieved to be on the highest group of the school and i'm not saying this uh to talk well about myself or whatever i'm saying this because it may feel like you you may need to have the you feel like you need to speak to uh improve but if you're reading and listening eventually speaking will be much easier and uh, ironically, the first question that uh, the teacher asked me when I entered the classroom, because I arrived late, uh, she said, uh, had you studied all the grammar? And, <laughs> and I said, like, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and yes, I just wanted to share that. How, how many years had the rest of the students been studying Italian for in their school? <laughs> Probably, uh, I don't know, five years, actually. It was the highest level of school was C1. And uh, so there were people who had, I don't know, like an Italian mother, but lived in Switzerland though, and so on. And I, I felt uh, a bit behind in writing, but uh, in terms of communicating, I, I could uh, be at the same level of the audience, other students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. <laughs> that's good great yeah great story um okay well thanks again everybody for joining us Thank and you. um we'll sign off now but look forward to our next gathering take care thank you for inviting me okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.